Hello, my name is Luis Otavio Zorzala, I go by Z, and this is the Juiceberry 3.0 tutorial. I'm the creator of Juiceberry. Uh, we have just released 3.0 a couple of months ago, and uh, the tutorial is all available online. This we're going to walk over what exists in there, and we're going to cover in great detail uh, so that you can understand it to its completeness. So the first thing that I want to talk about is I want to very briefly cover the difference between unit versus application testing. I want to go onto the hello server. I'm going to dissect it in very many details. It's the class that is going to use we're going to use from the very beginning of the tutorial all the way up to we talk about controllable injections, which is a very cool concept, very advanced neat thing that we can do uh, with Chooseberry, leverage Chooseberry to do. Um, but then it's a rather complex thing if you just go at it at first. So let's start with unit versus application test. I want to make very clear distinction that I'm making between these two things. So your unit test is your fast white box test. It's a test code calling your production code. There is a little or no setup and teardown. Really, your canonical unit test will require no setup or teardown because it will create instances of its own classes if they are well behaved. If you do have some static state, you might need to uh, set up and tear down something in there, but ideally you would have very little or no at all set up or tear down. Um, uh, unit test would test a single code path, like an if statement, that's what I want to think about. It tests uh, some code path in a method in a class. And it tests each class, or rather each code path in isolation. And it tests all possible paths, including exceptional paths. And it catches all sorts of bugs that application tests don't. So what are application tests? They are slow and they are black box, meaning they are test code that pretends to be a user to your system. They require heavy setup and tear down. So in order for you to pretend to be a user, you need to start your server before you even begin your tests. Then you need to start a browser with some piece of infrastructure that allows your test to drive that browser and then interact with the server this way. The test will use that to click the UI, save, this is a browser, it will click buttons in the browser, it will type things into the browser, and then it will inspect the browser's output to see whether um, it, what it expects to happen does happen. And it tests an entire system, uh, just like your end user would find a system, but every now and again your large tests, your black box tests, your application tests, your so different names sort of for the same thing, they may need backdoors. So for example, if you will have a system that does that does weather reporting, you might want to see what happens when the weather is sunny or whether it's cloudy, whether it's rainy. And you don't control that. You don't control what's the current weather. So you may need a backdoor to have your test be able to tell the server, pretend today is sunny. Uh, or you want to be able to test your, to, to run your test and say pretend today is uh, February the 29th in a leap year. Or some other thing that you want to pretend. Pretend my credit card was declined or my credit card was accepted and charged. Something that the user can't uh, himself initiate. The, your black box test, your application test, they test the usual paths. As you get into t trying to test unusual paths, it becomes harder and harder. You need more and more backdoors from the test to the server and you get diminishing returns in that regard. So they usually, because they're slow and they're hard to simulate things, you will rely on your small tests to, to catch the more exceptional paths and you will cover more of the usual paths in, in this. And it really catches all sorts of bugs that unit tests don't. So this is your canonical application test. You have some piece of test code that over TCP, say, talks to a web browser, plus some plugin extension or something that runs in that browser that over HTTP talks to the server. In this particular case, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about JUnit for tests driving an HTML unit uh, with WebDriver. I'm not going to use a real browser because it's just more self-contained. It's easier to, to demonstrate in a tutorial, and that's going to drive a Jetty server where we have our simulated production code running. So let's 
talk about the tutorial. The tutorial can be found at juicepair.google.com, um, where you can also find these slides if you can't for some reason read them, um, or if you just want to get to the text of them. Tutorial is 100% functional. This is code that if you download the source code from the website, you can load directly into your Eclipse and run as tests, and all the tests are going to pass. Um, uh, the tutorial has been tailored for the slides to take less real state, so I, you know, I don't do as many line breaks and stuff just so that we can fit in the slides. Otherwise, it's the exact same tutorial you find uh, on the on the website. And uh, there are versions of JUnit 3 and JUnit 4, JUnit 3 with or without their down test case. There's also a test NG version of the tutorial. All of these, the very same tutorial, very similar to one from the other. They're available online. We're actually going to talk about all these three versions so that you understand the differences between of them and between the different frameworks. And once we have that covered, we're going to move on and we're going to cover just JUnit 4 for the rest of the, the, the time. So imagine that this is the page that we want to test. Look at the bold part in there. Basically, it's uh, an HTML page uh, that has a title, Welcome to the Pet Store. It has a div with an ID welcome that reads welcome in the body and that's it. That's focus on this part for now. It's just a simple servlet that we're gonna that we, we wanna test. Say this is the thing that we want to test. So let's say this is our test. Let's focus in here again always on what is bold and there we want to test pet store welcome message. But ba so basically to do that we need to go to localhost against a particular port number where our server is running. We want to find the element by ID welcome, and we want to assert that the text in that element is welcome. Yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward. This is a JUnit 4 uh, example of JuiceBerry. Let's focus on the JUnit 4 part of this. Uh, there is an at rule in there. There's a JuiceBerry rule. That's how you hook that test onto JuiceBerry that rule is going to point from this test to something that you also write, it's called petstore-m0-simple.class that is a class that is going to contain the stuff that JuiceBerry is going to use in order to to be able to run this, this test and it has an add test annotation to test, this is the boilerplate required both by JuiceBerry and JUnit4 really and if we talk about JUnit 3 with teardown test case, you can see that the test is extremely similar to that except the setup of the test requires a setup and you call an auto teardown juiceberry.setup passing the same pet store and zero simple and if we want to use JUnit 3 without the teardown test case infrastructure that's the same thing that we need to do, but we also need to do some teardown at the end of the test, so we need to store something that is given to us by the manual teardown juiceberry env setup method. But again, conceptually, it's the same thing. We want to be able just to hook this test to pet store env0 simple. And this looks a lot like, as well, what we would find on a test ng class with an at before method and at after method to do the setup and teardown. Okay. I just presented this so that we can see the four different versions in there, of the four different supported test frameworks. Now we're going to go back into JUnit 4 and we're going to stick to it for the rest of the tutorial. So, if we're thinking about this test, in order for this test to operate, all we need is to be able to inject a web driver and a port number. If we manage to do that, by definition, we can actually run this test. Right, so that this is the only external thing that this test needs. Everything else, um, the test itself does. So, how do we get a web driver and a port number integer injected in here? How do we get bindings for these things with juice? So, here is the pet store and zero simple that I presented before that the test links to, and you can see that there's a binding from web driver to HTML units driver. That's one of the web driver a backend that allows you to to actually not need a browser is a very very rudimentary mm, browser uh, that is uh, that doesn't even do fancy JavaScript or anything like that but it will be enough for our tutorial so we also see a provider method that returns a port number by calling a free port finder find free port so basically it's like a random number 
that it will give as a port number it happens to be a port that is available in there that's the port that the server is going to use to start the server and it's also going to inject that same thing into the test okay so the other thing is like in this previous slide we didn't see anything about actually starting the server so how do we do it and here we can see that juiceberry allows us to bind something called a juiceberry env main to a particular class if there is a binding from juiceberry env main to a class what happens is that the very first time this um, to, uh, juiceberry environment is uh, run it's going to call that class and it's going to run its run method so in that class what we need to do at the bottom of this slide we see an injected pet store server that we call pet store server dot start in the run method so what we're thinking is at the very beginning the very first time that we run the test we want to bring up this server and the pet store server you can see right above it a uh, binding to just an instantiation of pet store server passing the port number it's the same port number that we inject that we acquire before it's the random number as I told you before that is returned by this free port finder uh, utility method so far so good so my pet store server prod code looks like this um, this is a jetty server that I'm using I uh, get an instance of this the first bold line in there get an instance on the port number that it has been passed to me and the start method basically just creates an injector with a get pet store module it starts the server and returns that result and you see at the bottom that I am serving on any URL that welcome page servlet that's the thing that we're trying to test to begin with okay so now let's look at the same test or rather the same test case but with two tests in it right both of them need to go to localhost on that port number first of them finds the ID the welcome div the, the div with the welcome ID the search the text is welcome the second one just to search the title of the page right so you think a little more about what is not boilerplate and here basically is the test name hopefully it's not boilerplate hopefully it's a meaningful test case name the test names themselves are also not boilerplate also not boilerplate is the idea that we need to find something with a welcome ID and we assert that the text is welcome same thing for the title but the rest of the class all of this stuff about web driver and port numbers and making this string manipulation concatenation to actually get the instance of web driver pointing to it which we also have to do in the other test it, this, this is all boilerplate this is stuff that is not actually detracts from us being able to read our test properly so just very is very neat in allowing you to use this pattern where you can where you can actually use composition very naturally in your test to cut down this boilerplate how does that look like let's say we had a welcome test page right and the web welcome test page has a way for me to go to it and they assert that the welcome message is welcome or anything else that I want or they assert that the title is some something or some other which is what I'm doing in the second test so what would and you see that gets injected in into this into this test so what does that look like we have a welcome test page page object that itself has a web driver in, injected and has the port number injected and the go to method does that you know string concatenation that we need in order to be able to get to it all of this nasty logic is hidden in here so if I were to ever change for example the div ID from welcome to something else the only place that I would need to change would be in here in my test a lot more readable to boot so this is this is a very neat pattern that that arises naturally from using juiceberry I do that all the time in my projects so let's look at something else in the server code now because uh, we have already covered the basic of the basic of juiceberry so let's look at something interesting in here in the server we have a featured pet injected in our servlet and we show a message in there saying today's featured pet is 
whatever the featured pet provider get method returns to us. So what does it return to us? Well, in your real production server, your featured pet would be determined by whatever your featured pet would be determined by. Maybe you want to feature a different pet depending whether the person is in California or Texas because it's least of shipping costs, I don't know. Or maybe you want to feature something different depending on the, on the month, whatever pet is in season, I guess. So, in this particular case, let's look at what we do. How do we simulate that sort of stuff in our tutorial in there? On the server, we have Jusa Create Injector Get Pet Store module. The Get Pet Store module returns a new pet store module. Let's look at this for the first time. This code has been in there. I, I omitted it the first time around that I went through this. So, we can see that the provider for the featured pet calls this method cal calculate featured pet which basically returns a random value out of the pet in num okay that's completely bogus i mean it's just put in here in red okay this is completely bogus of course you're not going to have something like this in your server but for all practical purposes as far as the test is concerned the value that is returned in that area of the screen is random because it's not deterministic it's, it's it's whatever the featured pet happens to be at that particular point in time okay so just for completeness sake here's the pet enum bunch of pets in there it has a featured binding annotation that's all the boilerplate necessary to create a binding annotation nothing particularly interesting about any of this and then we have in here the test I can very easily create in the welcome test page a method to say assert that the featured pet is some pet all we need to do is find whatever is the featured pet by ID in the page and assert that the text of that is the same text from the element that I receive um, that I find in the page right this fine but we get my fictitious test in here I go into the welcome page and then what do I assert my featured pet to be? I, I don't know, it's a random value for me, for the test. Test has no idea what to assert in there. How can I test that? Okay, that's where controllable injections come into mind. Now, here's what I want you to understand. A controllable injection in and of itself is just a pattern, okay? It's a way for us to provide backdoors in the server, just like I described on my very first content slide, so that I can have the test simulate all sorts of different things in the server. I want you to understand that controllable injections can be done manually, but to do that would be very verbose. And also, if you don't do it right, it can be very dangerous, right? So basically, you're having something outside of your server be able to muck around with contents from the server you don't want to you want to you don't want any of that leaking onto your end users right so use that with caution but it is conveniently prepackaged in juiceberry in a way to make it very safe to use it and not verbose at the same time so why don't we take a look at what it is so first let's do it by hand how can we provide a backdoor in the server. Oh, it's very simple, right? Let's look at the bottom of this slide for a second in here. You see, calculated feature, calculate featured pet will, before returning the featured pet, he will look at the static override. This is test code. Look, this is exist. This is an I, I extended my regular pet store module in there so that I could tinker with that protected method called calculate featured pet. And what I do is, again, I look at the over an override, a public static override in there. If the override is not null, I return that. Otherwise, I return whatever my parent would return, which is, in this case, a random value. Okay, so far so good. So nothing, nothing different, okay, because overwrite by default is null except that I can go into my test look at this I can go into my test 
And at the very beginning of the test, I say, okay, let's let's say that my expected pet is a dog, okay? Then I go into that server override and I set that static to be whatever the expected value is. Okay, look at the bottom, skip the teardown for a second, then I can assert the feature pet is that expected pet. This will work. It's not a problem. Okay, so long as server and test needs to be running on the same class loader, right? For simplicity's sake. Same JVM, same class loader. So the test can tinker around with the static variable because that is shared with the server. And it can have the server do whatever it wants to. Okay? Whatever the test wants to simulate in the server. I add a teardown in here. It's a neat thing. Juiceberry gives me for free an injection for teardown acceptor. I add a teardown. Basically what it means is that at the end of my test, this teardown gets run and it resets that override to null. Okay, just so that I become a good neighbor. Otherwise, as soon as this test is over, any other thing that revisits the server from that moment on until I stop the server and I restart it, or rather I stop the JVM and I restart it, will pack, will, 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 will get dog as the featured path and not a random value as I expected before. Okay, this works. It's naive, it's simple, it's manual, it's dangerous because of the static stuff. Right, it's very global, but it works. Now, let's make it a little more complicated just for a second in here. Okay, let's imagine that the server, instead of storing a single static for all requests, would store a overwrite specific for a single test. Okay, so you see. At the bottom of the second half of this slide, what we have is a public static map of test ID to pet override. Rather than a single static override, I have a map from test ID to pet. And test ID, again, is something given for free. It's an injection that is given for free by Juiceberry. It is something that uniquely identifies that test. You can think of it as a random value that uniquely identifies the test for the duration of that test. And then when the next test comes up, there's a new test ID associated with it. Okay. So I'm going to do some hand waving in here. You can look at the code in more detail online. The whole code is, is, is functional. But let's say that my test can actually get the instance. Sorry, this code in here, this get featured pad can get the instance of the server's injector, right? to find out what is the current test ID in the server. And if it is not null, right? If, well, so rather, if it get that, that value from the map, and if that override is not null, return that, rather than whatever is the calculate featured path would return. OK? Now, see, I told you that this is coming. This is running on the server's injector, not the client's, not the test's injector. So the server also needs to know what is the current test ID and how do we do that. So that's when the first half of this slide comes into view. Now I changed my web driver to be given by a provider method. That provider method, after it does driver dot get the localhost plus port number, or what are first rather uh, after it creates an instance of an HTML in a driver, it goes and visits the localhost port number, and then it adds a cookie with the test ID cookie name, test ID to a string. Okay, so here, my test, when it runs at the very beginning of the test, it would set a cookie on the browser, and the server will receive what is the test ID for that test that is running right now. With that cookie, I manage in the server to actually find out what is the test ID of the test is running and run that code. Okay, I'm going to hand wave again. All of this code is available online. You can follow it. It's kind of it's, it's very strange to follow, but it conceptually is very simple. I am tying my test and my server together based on the test ID, and I'm using the cookie to exchange that information between the clients, the tests, thread and the servers, the servers thread, okay? 
And once I find out what is the test ID on the server, I can look at the map. And of course the test, now if I look at it, I will, instead of setting the global override, I will be putting in the global override something, something expected related to this test ID. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing that I did before, except now is a map. The advantage of doing that, I'm still doing the teardown to remove that from the map. Everything is still the same. The advantage of doing that is my test is not stepping on each other's in another test store or anything else, right? So if I were to forget to unset my my test ID, my, my override on my test ID, the other test will have a different test ID so it wouldn't be overridden or if I want to manually go in there and visit the server, I would still find a random value and even furthermore, I can actually run two tests at the same time, parallel with each other, same JVM, and they would get their own expected values. They can have different expected values and they would still work because they are keyed off of the test ID. Okay? So if you understand this, this is the controller injection, the injection controller magic that Juiceberry can provide for you. Okay? It does the same thing, but it does it under the covers. Let me show you how the test looks like first. If we set up injection controllers in your Juiceberry environment. You gain an injection for free of an injection controller of whatever you're controlling in the server. In this case I'm controlling a featured PET. Okay, so I'm at injecting an at feature injection controller of PET in my test. This injection I get for free so long as I tell Juiceberry I set it up. I set controllable injections properly and I tell it that I want to control path. I will show how to do that in the next slide. And then I go into the test and I say, oh, whenever I want, say, please set the override on the server to be whatever I expect it to be, in this case, being a dog. This code will itself take care of keying in by the test ID, it will take care of cleaning itself up after the test is done. It will do all of that bookkeeping for you. So all you need to do is this. Let me show you what this looks like in my Juiceberry environment. So in my Juiceberry environment, on the configure method, let's look at the half, the bottom half of this page. In my configure method, I create an instance of a class called IC master, so injection controller master, and I tell it that I want to control the pet, the featured pet. That's what the key dot get pet dot class comma feature dot class line means. Okay, it's a little more verbose because of the fact that this is a that this is a an annotated injection. Okay, the line in between that says that controls using a particular strategy static map injection controller strategy in there um, is is basically just the strategy that we are using what we're saying is that and this is the only one that comes prepackaged with juiceberry it's saying let's have a static map that is shared between client and server and if both of them run in the same jvm same class loader this is the simplest most logical thing to do i can envision other strategies to be used but this one is the only one that i can really package or the one only one that i have so far packaged out of the box. Okay. Last line in the bottom half I see install icmaster.build client module and that is the thing that adds to my Juiceberry's in injectors list of bindings that binding to a feature uh, an injection controller of feature pet that I saw in the test. On the top half of this on my pet store server what I need to do is there are two things that I need to do. First is I need to install this test ID server module. That's something that comes from Juiceberry. That's what gives the thing, gives a test ID injection on the server that is going to read that from the cookie, just like in the other example we saw. Okay. And more importantly than that, it rewrites the binding. See, <laughs> rather than returning the get pad store module as the server would do, it rewrites all of the bindings on the server. 
to play what I can only describe as a benign man in the middle attack. He would look at that IC master and say, oh, you know what? You say you wish to control the injection of pets or featured pets. Yes. So when I create this bind, when I find this binding declared on my server module, I'm going to rewrite that binding. I'm going to wrap that binding around something that it's going to look at whatever is the strategy, in this case, the static map that I share between client and server. I'm going to look, is there an override in there? If so, I'm going to return that. Otherwise, I'm going to return whatever I'm going to delegate to whatever was the original binding for that. Okay, the only caveat to that is, of course, you need to to be careful of scopes, right? If you have a binding to something that is a singleton, you can't really control that. You would have to change your binding to be something that, that is basically either request scoped or smaller than that, okay? Now, this, this seems rather a good bit of code in order to get this functionality. It's not like the, I, I was telling you, oh, Juiceberry provides all of this for free for you. And it still seems quite quite a bit of code, right? But the good news in here is that the vast majority of this code is just like a one-time boilerplate. Once you set up controllable injections, you need to, in order to set up controllable injections, you need to create the IC master, you need to, to get this build client module and stuff. But once you do that, for every binding that you want to be able to tinker with in the server, all it takes is a line of code, just like this bold line in there. If I had more injections that I wanted to control, I just put a comma in there and keep on getting other things, declaring other things to be controllable. Okay? And now time for Q&A we're not going to have in here. This is a talk that I have given in uh, live. Now I'm going to re I'm just re-recording. Uh, but I wanted to, to just take the time to give thanks to all of these people who have given me all the support that I need to get to this point. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Hopefully it was useful to you. Please uh, send questions and other things to the mailing list on the website. And I hope you have fun with Juiceberry and uh, that it's useful, as useful for you as it is for me. Because for me it is rather very useful. Okay, bye-bye.